to The Jay Kim Show, Hong Kong's first dedicated podcast on investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Today's show guest is John P. Reese, who is an ex-tech entrepreneur turned quant investor. John has developed computer models that are based on the published strategies of several world-famous financial investors, including Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, and Benjamin Graham. He's also a frequent speaker, writer, columnist, and the founder of Validia Capital Management and also of Validia.com, a research website that allows visitors to use his screening tools to invest based off those same strategies used by Wall Street's most successful investors. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jay. So you, I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you today because I've, uh, I've, you know, I've obviously, uh, we run in some of the same circles. I've heard a lot about uh, what you do um, and I've listened to some of your prior uh, uh, interviews and I've checked out your website multiple times. So um, maybe you can give us a background, a little bit of background though, because this is a podcast on both entrepreneurship and investing. So I think you have a unique background that the audience would appreciate and enjoy to hear. Mm, thank you. Um, it starts, basically, I went to um, MIT to study computers and electronics. And while I was there, I worked at MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And the key project that I was working on was taking human wisdom and knowledge that was in books and interpreting that so that computers could understand and actually process uh, that information and come to the same decisions and conclusions. Many, many years later, I would come back to use that um, key uh, technology and technique. I then went on to work in industry as a engineer. I was probably one of the first hundred engineers in the country to work with something called a microprocessor. This was back in the day of the Intel 4004 uh, microprocessor. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, we know where uh, that went. Uh, I then went <laughs> back uh, to um, for my uh, MBA, Harvard Business School, uh, specializing in finance and strategic planning, and went out in the birth of the personal computer industry. This was happening right at that very time. We had the original um, uh, TRS-80 and the Altair computer and I joined uh, Texas Instruments for a secret project on their uh, personal computers, um, spent some time there, then went on to uh, GTE, a big uh, telephone and telecommunications firm, which has now become um, Verizon, and then back into the personal computer field and electronic fields uh, with Coleco Electronics. And after that, I had the idea that, hey, it'd be possible to connect computers uh, together, these little inexpensive computers, and if you tie enough of them together, you can equal the power of a mainframe for one one thousandth of the price. So, so I founded a company that specialized in networking at the very, very beginning of that, of connecting computers together, grew that over nine years, and sold it out to uh, GE Capital. So. Wow. That's, that um, describes my time in um, industry, my first round with entrepreneurship, and now I was looking at, well, how do I invest money? I'd always been interested for a long time in the stock market, and I started reading and more reading and more reading until I was uh, uh, going through about 50 different periodicals and publications uh, from Forbes and Fortune and Business Week and Wall Street Journal and Money and Smart Money and uh, many others. Uh, researching who should I listen to, how should I best make the decisions for investing in the stock market. I went through uh, almost a five-year research uh, project on that. Along the way of doing that, I was starting to read uh, many of the great uh, books by legendary investors, and one really stood out to me. There was a light bulb that went off when I read Peter Lynch's one up on Wall Street. So right. here was somebody who 
basically uh, he grew his mutual fund to be the number one biggest in the entire uh, world, the Magellan Fund. He had a track record, and in the book he was very descriptive of how he went about making the decisions of what stocks to invest in. And furthermore, that's when that, that uh, MIT artificial intelligence training came in. I was able to use those uh, techniques and algorithms for interpreting um, the book and coming up with a computer model of how Peter Lynch basically says he goes about picking stocks. So right. I tried that, and that actually worked uh, successfully over a very short period of time, which is very, very uh, encouraging. Um, although, as I've, I've learned um, over the years, you can't just use a short-term uh, method, you know, if it works um, over a short testing period and believe that that will work successfully forever. But what I was kind of lucky about is I picked a strategy that already had a long-term successful track record uh, to it. So right. that proved successful. So I went on to another book that really impressed me, which was The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham is considered the father of uh, value investing. And I was able to interpret yes. his models, put that into a computer program. This, uh, I then started publishing research of what I was doing uh, on the internet. This is the time when the internet was just starting to um, uh, take off. And that caught on and eventually became the uh, basis for a website, validity.com, that offered uh, a x-ray from uh, 12 different legendary investors or investing techniques of you know any particular ticker symbol that you want to type in, and you would get my best interpretation of what the legendary guru said they used to figure out whether you should invest in a particular stock or not. So it was highly uh, educational and highly valuable as a investment tool. So that's um, where I sort of uh, came from, and my first you know attempt at. Uh, uh, networking uh, as an entrepreneur it resulted in the networking company, but then this accidental research in investing in the stock market uh, led to the launching of the second company or set of companies, uh, Validia, as they exist today. That's an awesome background. Thank you for giving that. I think that uh, it, it's it's pretty fascinating. There's a couple of, of guys I've met that uh, – that used to be sort of tech entrepreneurs that are now full-time investors. And I think that uh, it's, it's, I think, uh, you know, from a challenge standpoint, it's probably one of the only uh, other fields or areas that uh, someone can just dive in and uh, sort of self do a lot of self study uh, without having to go through necessarily formal schooling or education and, and get involved uh, and probably have the same sort of challenges and that tech, uh, you know, that tech gave you. But um, so I think it's pretty interesting how you came along uh, in your journey to become an investor. Uh, and I, I'm just curious. So all the sort of uh, the models that you, you you mentioned, you were using some of your early AI models. Those were all. Uh, I mean, that's all proprietary stuff that you built and you sort of uh, adjusted based on the various books and methodologies that uh, you read about from these gurus. Um, yes. When I first did this at um, MIT, there were techniques that we used to capture the wisdom within books. And that's what I essentially used uh, as I read these uh, books by the legendary guru uh, investors. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, those the, the two books that you mentioned are obviously classics. And uh, I, I find it, it very interesting because, uh, you know, I think many investors kind of share the same journey uh, that you did uh, without the robustness and uh, and ana analytics behind it, but you know it's very easy for for anyone to go and pick up a, a book from the bookstore and uh, and start their education that way. But to actually you know aggregate all that together into a system, uh, I you know I, I don't think many people have done it. It's true. It's true. But and by the way, you know I've met uh, many people who've read quite a number of these books. Uh, but often 
that's as far as they can take it. They're very, very impressed when they find out that I've actually created a computer program that then implements the idea of that particular book so that they can apply that to, you know, any stock in the, um, the stock market that they like. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and, and that's exactly would be the same case for me because I've, I've read uh, many, many investing books. And uh, it, it's kind of like when you read a book, you, you kind of try to pick one or two things that you can extract from it and you try to apply it. But there's no methodology uh, really when you're implementing these things. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's exciting. So maybe we can, uh, maybe we could just start, uh, with a little bit of an overview for those in the audience that aren't familiar with sort of quant investing or factor-based investing. Uh, how would you describe, um, you know, quant, uh, like a quant, uh, strategy or factor-based investing uh, strategy versus a very simple sort of fundamental based investing strategy, which I think a lot of uh, sort of equity investors uh, uh, lean towards? Well, there are some overlaps, but let me start by saying that quant or factor investing looks to identify groups of stocks that have certain characteristics. Now, some of those characteristics are um, technical or categorical in nature, um, such as if they're a small cap stock or momentum. But there are other factors that look at value. Now, it's interesting, there are many ways of judging value, and that's where there's some overlap with fundamental-based investing. So fundamental-based investors may look at the um, income statement and balance sheet of particular companies and say that this particular company, its price-to-book ratio or price-to-earnings ratio uh, are very lowly valued compared to the overall market. They're unpopular. So fundamental based investing looks at a lot of accounting data uh, over, well, it depends upon a period of time. It could be just quarterly or it could be over several years and interprets that in particular ways and uses certain rules. Quant or factor based investing in some ways is simpler, but it looks to apply that to the entire stock market at any one time and find the best of those stocks according to that factor and the worst of those stocks according to the factor. It'll then buy those stocks long that are that are proved. And in, in many cases, they'll sell the stock short that are the worst uh, over the list. But basically, it's based on some academic research for factor-based investing that have shown where the long-term pockets of outperformance of the market uh, can be found. So right. those are those are the, the factors, and that's how I would describe the difference in the type of styles. So, so a, a part of it also, I think, is um, there's a, a bit of a smoothing for the human emotion element, I think. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the qualitative, qualitative uh, criteria in a bit. But I, I'm curious if you could explain... What is your process in finding or identifying these gurus? I mean, you mentioned uh, Peter Lynch and and uh, you know Benjamin Graham and and Warren Buffett. Uh, you know, you have a handful of others. What was the process in which you identified and selected the gurus to model your uh, your your data off off of? Sure, I had a few major criteria. Uh, one, I wanted to see a track record of outperforming the market. The actual track record could be the person's money management background or it could be a academic uh, paper on it. Uh, two, the strategy had to be uh, quantifiable in some nature. You couldn't just say um, you should uh, hire good managers and the CEO needs to be a good person. There needs to be some uh, detailed numbers that can be uh, analyzed within that. And the third thing is the book had to be very clear in terms of how to actually apply the, the principles. And simply saying buy low PE stocks, which it sort of makes um, a lot of sense, but what is meant by the, uh, you know, how low is uh, low to, to cut off and, and um, qualify? And earnings, are you talking about future earnings, past earnings, earnings over one year, earnings over trailing 12 months, earnings over um, uh, the prior three years? So uh, some uh, authors and legendary investors 
were much more detailed and considerate uh, than others when they came to actually spelling what they did and often included examples that illustrated that or further refined the points. So those were the three key criteria that I needed to identify somebody as a um, qualified as a guru investor for us. And is there one in particular that is your quote unquote favorite or I, I know that's a difficult, it's kind of a, a loaded question. But. Yeah, you're, you're asking me if um, I have like a uh, favorite um, child and I have three uh, kids of my own. Um, so there are different things about each uh, that I like. I, one is I uh, use a Warren Buffett uh, model and I like him because he uses the longest um, uh, data set. Of course, has a great track record, a very patient uh, investor. I also like the um, uh, Graham model, um, again, because it, in some ways it's a very simple approach, yet he finds uh, really good um, uh, values. But it's hard to to pick or identify just uh, one as my, uh, my truly my favorite. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, you know, the, the criteria you were talking about, about track record, I think that's, that's, uh, that's so important, especially these days. I mean, you know, a lot of fund managers nowadays, uh, they'll come, they'll spin off from, say, a, another pedigreed firm, and then they'll get seeded by a larger institutional investor or the likes of that. And, um, but it's, it's hard because, uh, you know, there's, they're, they're in this position where they're expected to outperform based off of their past performance, but you don't necessarily know. And then a lot of times, uh, you know, there's, I think there's a quote that, or some sort of saying in investing where, uh, it's actually, it's, it's actually bad if, if you're, if you get everything right in the beginning, yes. because you, you end up, uh, growing this confidence and, and, uh, and, and it's not sustainable. So, um, so okay, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the qualitative uh, side of things. So some of the gurus uh, that you follow, emulate, have uh, qualitative investment criteria. Can you give an example of how you handle that aspect uh, of some of their strategies in the in your quant models? Sure. Um, so maybe we can use Buffett um, as an example. So Buffett likes to find companies with uh, a competitive uh, advantage or uh, one way of uh, explaining that is he wants to see a moat around the business. Right. So that is something that is actually hard to qualitatively judge. You could just look and subjectively say, you know, uh, such and such a firm has a moat or a competitive advantage uh, or a um, the brand. But what we've actually found is that if this is true, these things actually show up in the numbers. And Buffett's uh, handles this by using 10 years of, for instance, earnings. He likes to see 10 years of pretty much steadily increasing earnings with uh, very few exceptions to that. So that's one of the signs that the company actually does have a identifiable uh, moat or some sort of brand differentiation. He looks to see that the return on equity of the company is high. Again, if a company can retain, uh, return a, a higher capital than its its peers, that is also an indication that there is some sort of moat or protection that it has. So a lot of these qualitative uh, criteria actually come out within the financial criteria that they are known for. They actually go together. Right. That's 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 pretty interesting as well. Um, and and so by just listening to 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 sort of the first part of this interview, I mean it's it's pretty clear that uh, look, uh, stock selection is 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 very very difficult. It's very involved. Screening, you know, I mean people uh, you talk about stock screens, and 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 I do. I'm guilty of this as well. You know, I'll throw up some screens on Bloomberg and and try to just screen out for X, Y, and Z criteria, and then. Uh, see if I found uh, you know the next big winner and that sort of thing, but it, it it goes it goes much deeper than that. And I think that uh, there's there 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 is this sort of naivete in, in some investors or or begin early you know beginning investors that think that they can just simply just uh, you know pull up a couple screens and be able to be a successful investor. Yes, and I, I would sort of add um, on to that. It's very interesting, but uh, many people start by something that they 
hear of. Again, like buy low PE as a company. How do they know that that is actually a successful strategy? So they start with the disadvantage because they don't really know. They start with some assumptions. Then second of all, um, how do they know that the strategy is a, one that will last for a long time through different kinds of uh, stock market cycles. Again, most don't know that. So they're throwing little facts against the walls. They come up with a screen. You know, it sounds good, but it's not necessarily based on a long-term track record. And if anything I've found, it's very, very important to base this on long-term track records or long-term academic studies to identify where the key success factors in the market are. That's right. Absolutely right. Um... So what and when it comes to modeling your portfolios, uh, and they're based off of the the various gurus uh, and the strategies, uh, how do you uh, how do you sort of deal with sort of diversification, uh, number of stocks, portfolio concentration? Um, because people have different views on that um, as well. Well, I think the research shows that. Um, an absolute minimum, you need 16 stocks to have a diversified portfolio, and that assumes that you intentionally select the stocks to be diversified with different um, industry groups. Uh, typically, 20 to 30 is defined as the minimum. So we like to see, um, at a minimum, portfolio sizes of 20 uh, in order to receive diversification. But even then, it's very, very interesting. Uh, since the main stock market uh, average, the S&P uh, 500, consists of 500 stocks uh, by definition, it is entirely possible and likely that there will be substantial periods of time where any 20 stock portfolio you have uh, will be at variance, out of sync with the market. Now, hopefully that's a, out of sync in a positive way, but it could also be in a negative way. But there will be plenty of periods of uh, time that way. One of the big problems with only a 20 stock portfolio is that the vast majority of people will then interpret when it's underperforming as they're doing something wrong and will exit the portfolio strategy. This is assuming that they've chosen one that has a good long-term track record. And that's a very difficult human emotion to overcome. So even though technically 16 to 20 is the, the minimum number you need for diversification. In reality, people need many, many more to avoid doing something very different than the index, which will get them into emotional trouble. Right. And so I think that uh, that's also a very good point, because even as you're following, let's say you were to follow these strategies, uh, the sort of DIY investor who <laughs> who uh, basically doesn't follow it blindly, but basically thinks, oh, you know, I, I, I can trim this or I can add this or I can rebalance this. Uh, they actually end up uh, hurting themselves, right? Uh, very true, because they don't really know. They're, they're making some assumptions that it's right. And the stock market or what the stocks are invested in them can turn and go down relative to their expectations or, or the entire market can go down and the vast majority will react in the emotional manner and at some point that they will you know exit from the market usually at the the worst point of uh, time <laughs> and be afraid to actually get back in the market until the market is uh, not only recovered, but you know it's gone up by 100. percent Right. Okay. So let's let's uh, let's let's walk through some of the the offerings that you have at, at Validia. You know, I've I've uh, studied your website a bit. Um, you obviously have the various portfolios. How many portfolios do you have now, based on the gurus? Uh, I have uh, 12 uh, public-facing portfolios and a number that I also maintain that uh, for private in my uh, capital management firm. Right. Okay. So, so you have you have the the um, the model portfolios, and that's uh, if if I was just a you know an investor that wanted to to uh, follow these uh, this model portfolio, is that just a a, sub a subscription based thing that I could uh, access on your website? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's a subscription based thing. That's the easiest way to follow it. Here, you've got a, a strategy with a good long term track record, and assuming that you're looking for you know long term strategies. Uh, one could simply just uh, follow the model. But the other tool that's also available uh, by subscription is uh, what I call guru analysis, which is the X-ray by 12 
uh, guru strategies for a particular stock that you're thinking about. So if you want to learn how to become a better stock picker or why or why not Peter Lynch would like a particular stock that you're thinking about, it's extremely easy to get an answer that's uh, uh, very easy to understand. Right. Uh, so in addition to that, uh, actually, before we move on from that, is there one, which one of the strategies is the best performing? <laughs> Um, as of the current time, interestingly enough, it's the one based on the Motley Fool uh, small uh, capitalization stock uh, strategy has been outperforming. That looks at uh, for high relative performance. It looks for uh, high quality firms. Um, you know that are increasing its uh, earnings. Has quite a lot of other uh, stringent uh, criteria that it looks for. And that has been, uh, you know, blowing the doors off of uh, 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 many of the other strategies. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting. And so, if if I were an investor that that would sign up for that this service, uh, it would basically be. I mean, you would basically lay out exactly the stocks that we need to be in and the rebalancing schedule. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That's awesome. Uh, okay, and then so in addition to that, you mentioned uh, you, you are running a fund as well uh, that is emulating some of these strategies. Well, two, two things. Um, I do run for higher net worth um, clients, uh, private uh, money, that I'm able to blend the strategies together in a custom portfolio for them for following um, an equity strategy. Um, for... Um, Clients or uh, interested people who have uh, a smaller amount of money to invest, I now have what's known as a digital advisor or robo advisor that um, is able to allocate not just in this uh, the stock market strategies, but across several different assets depending upon how uh, aggressive or conservative they want to be. Uh, that's an excellent way of managing money with uh, very low fee structure. And then finally, which we're sort of getting to, is a uh, ETF, uh, electronically tradable fund, that basically has 10 guru strategies, each picking 10 stocks. And that's available for somebody for as low, you know, $30. They can buy uh, one share of that and still get the guru type of, um, you know, wisdom and uh, advice. Right. Okay. And so, for the robo advisor fund, are there there are there minimums there as well for an investor? Yeah, uh, the robo it's about twenty five thousand. That compares to we have uh, two hundred fifty thousand minimum on our client side for asset management, but the robo has a much lower uh, minimum. And as far as uh, just uh, the, the DIY investor that wants to just follow one of your models uh, with the subscription base, is is there a, a sort of a, a optimal minimal portfolio size that you would recommend? Mm, um, it can be done with even as little as a thousand dollars, because don't forget you are diversifying into uh, at least ten, if not twenty, different uh, stocks. Now there are different. Um, institutions or brokerage firms you can go where you can trade that low of stocks uh, very economically, but you also have to, you know, allow, uh, you know, for the cost of commissions and uh, trading. So that makes it um, impractical for most people to have a smaller portfolio size than, uh, let's say, $1,000 in terms of following that. It would be much better in that case just to buy, you know, one share or 10 shares or 100 shares of the ETF. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, okay, cool. So, so thanks for outlining that. Uh, so, the audience listening in, you have uh, various levels uh, of uh, offering from, from John and his company. And uh, depending on your sort of uh, amount that you want to invest and, and how hands-on you want to get, uh, I guess I guess it would... Uh, it would all, but I would think that it would benefit anyway uh, to to sort of try the uh, the DIY and, and and following some of these strategies because I think that I, I just think it's interesting because you could learn a lot about uh, the various uh, gurus and and how they how they how they uh, how they model their strategies. So, uh, but I guess if you're if you're a lazier investor and just want to give John your money, then he'll, he'll take it too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, great. Okay, so John, I just have a couple uh, other, you know, sort of bigger picture questions for you uh, as we look to to wrap up. But but thank you for your time. It's been it's been uh, really interesting to hear about the work you're doing there. 
Um, what, my first question is, uh, you know, is sort of based on uh, me being based in Asia and uh, and you know emerging looking at emerging markets. Uh, you know, the U.S. U.S. markets are are quite overvalued by by a lot of metrics, uh, by a lot of measures. Um, do you? How do you feel about international stocks, uh, EM? Are, are there any of your portfolios that actually include them? Uh, you know, at this point. So yes, we do, and we agree. There are a number of um, uh, influential investors, including you know Jim uh, Oster, uh, Jeremy Grantham, that are really making the case for international stocks now, right now, particularly emerging markets. So the CAPE ratios, which is one very long-term measurement that we use for indicating overvaluation shows the U.S. market has been overvalued for some time now, but the international markets are uh, undervalued. So, yeah, uh, we're big believers that there are opportunities now in international. Yes, the models do find international stocks. Basically, they use the uh, stocks that are listed as ADRs on the U.S. stock exchange. So, and we've done that, so it has the best financial data. Uh, but there are, you know, many hundreds of stocks that go through these same models and get compared to American stocks. So when they uh, show great valuation characteristics and pass the the models of gurus, they are also selected. They come out as part of the models. Yeah, I think uh, I think I just saw that uh, Grantham put out his seven year outlook or something, and it was pretty. Uh, it was it was a little bit bearish on, on U.S. And, and definitely bullish, uh, more bullish on on EM. Um, Second question, second sort of second to last ish question for you, John. Um, as someone with a background, a deep background in sort of tech and AI, you know, AI is is it, you 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 seem to be been the pioneer uh, because AI now is very buzzy. You know, you hear about it all the time, uh, but uh, you know, you were working on AI, uh, you know, decades ago. Is there anything in that space, the tech world, that really excites you right now? You know, whether it's AI or blockchain or any any of these, uh, you know emerging tech uh, technologies? Um, so you're asking for technologies as compared to stocks. Uh, no, actually, I, I may be in the minority. <clears throat> I'm not impressed by um, blockchain. To me, it is another form of uh, database. It has particular characteristics with some advantages and disadvantages. But one of the disadvantages at the current time, uh, you know, if it can process five transactions a second and – out in the real world, you need 100,000 transactions a second. It still has quite a ways to, uh, to go. Uh, AI, particularly in the recent learning modules um, as technologies, uh, has a lot of uh, breakthroughs. I mean, even just a few years ago, there was no belief that uh, even with AI, computers would be able to autonomously drive cars. And now, look, uh, truly, uh, they can. So there's a lot of excitement around that. At the same time, I'm not over-optimistic uh, when you specifically apply it to the stock market because there's a lot of variability that it still can't uh, play against. The best thing it's got going for it is it's still unemotional and disciplined and doesn't get into the same mental patterns that, um, that uh, humans do. And then uh, – Obviously, in the biotechnology areas, there are a lot of exciting things that are coming through. They still have 10-year life cycles to go through to prove them out for their safety and efficacy. Uh, but a lot of things are coming out on the horizon to improve people's uh, comfort and um, uh, quality of life and length of life. Right. Uh, those are great insights. Uh, you know, finally, or sort of finally, for as far as your goals uh, for Validia and, or personally or professionally, is there anything that you're you know, working on that you're excited about that you want to share with the audience? Uh, are there, is, is the guru list locked or is there a constant search for potentially adding more to that list? <laughs> well, uh, I've, added more and kept track of more sort of behind the, the curtain, and we're up to over 40 different models. So we do keep our eyes out for it, and as um, academics come up with new factors and ways of combining those factors, we do keep our eyes on those particular models. But our particular goals for this year is to continue to really get out and educate people on what we've uh, developed and created here and 
what we believe in and in how to become the best and most successful long-term investors and how to use these uh, key proven factors in disciplined and unemotional manners. So those are our uh, goals uh, that we continue to put forth and to uh, innovate on. Fantastic. Well, it's been an engaging uh, discussion, John. Thank you so much for your time and walking us through uh, the exciting stuff that you're doing over at Validia. Where is the best place that people can find you or follow you or connect with you or maybe learn a little bit more about what you guys are working on there? Uh, I'm on Twitter at the, you know, at Guru Investor, but our research website is at uh, Validia.com spelled V as in Victor, A-L-I-D-E-A.com. And um, from there, you can also link to the money management site at validiacapital.com. Uh, right. Got it. So we'll get that all linked up in the show notes. Uh, thanks again, John. It, it was great catching up with you. And, uh, and we look forward to, uh, to following your work in the future. Jay, thanks for having me on. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.